Hi, I'm Mark Steiner, host of The Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. If you're watching or listening to this now, we know you appreciate the stories we bring to you. We need your support to continue producing uncompromising, movement-building journalism that reaches ordinary people. We don't accept advertising, sponsorships, or use paywalls. We rely entirely on supporters like you. This is a critical year and a pivotal moment in history. From Paris to Gaza to Baltimore, we're covering it all, but we cannot do it without you. If you feel the urgency of the moment and believe in the importance of independent journalism like TRNN, please donate today at therealnews.com forward slash donate. Thank you for your support. Solidarity forever. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us. And in our continuing look at what is happening in Palestine, Israel, this horrendous war that is taking place, we are going to cover it in a different way today. The other day I was I looked at a film called Where Olive Trees Weep. And I was really taken by that film. And these series of conversations are born of that film. That were, And you will hear many people from that film as well as the directors. And today we're talking with Cyrus Copeland who is executive director of Treedom, T-R-E-E-D-O-M, it's not me slurring, for Palestine. And Treedom for Palestine is a nonprofit that works in the West Bank and works in collaboration with the Palestinian Farmers Union. We'll be talking to the, one of the leaders of that union coming up soon. And Treedom wants to cultivate 1,000 freedom farms all through the West Bank. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And it is part of the struggle. It is going on there now, uh, and even though it sounds like a wonderful, nice project, nothing is easy in Palestine. And Cyrus Copeland, welcome. Good to have you with us. Mark, awfully good to be with you. Thank you, sir. So let's begin. So talk, tell me a bit about the, the history of this first, Treedom, and, 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 and how that came to be and what it is. Yeah. So I didn't start as a nonprofit uh, pioneer. I began and still am a writer. And the subject of the, of the book that I'm working on right now took me to Jerusalem and exploration of this idea of tikkun olam, which I don't know, do you, you know what that means? Yeah? Tikkun olam, yes. Repairing. Tikkun olam, it's this idea of repairing the earth or, or healing the earth. Right. I'm fascinated by it. I love it for all the obvious reasons, but I had precious little experience uh, with it and with olive trees in general. I had planted one tree over the span of my uh, life, in memory of my dad, uh, when he passed away, we planted an oak tree in Valley Forge for him. Huh. And after doing that, I would go back to the tree to kind of see how it's doing and, uh, you know, how tall it had grown, what its leafage was looking like, and realized that for better or for worse, I was, <laughs> I was now in a relationship with a tree. It struck <laughs> me as an odd and simple and beautiful thing. Right. But it wasn't until I got to... Uh, Palestine and specifically the West Bank that I and I looked around and realized how deeply multidimensional the Palestinian relationship is to their beloved olive trees. And I was very humbled by that and very touched by it. You know, it's it's legal, it's environmental, it's uh, economic, it's religious, it's spiritual, it's communal. All these ways that a tree influences a society and culture. And I was very impressed by that. But it wasn't until I landed in a, in a small slice of, um, on a small farm in the middle of the West Bank that was uh, started by a gentleman in Motaz, who was the very first freedom farmer, that I looked around and realized the simple enormity of what he had managed to do on this small tract of land in the middle of all the complications that come of being a farmer in Palestine. And I was really touched by it, Mark, touched in a very profound way. Um, as a writer, I'm kind of used to using my how I feel about stuff to navigate what a good narrative is. And I know when I've landed in the middle of a good story, I kind of get that goosebumpy feeling. Mm -hmm. As soon as I set foot on that freedom farm, I knew that it had found it and I had found it and it in some way had found me. I didn't intend to, when I went there, I didn't intend to start this foundation, uh, Treatment for Palestine, which plants sustainable olive tree farms in the West Bank. But the seed of that idea was born on that day 
on that little tract of land. And so that was how the, that was how this all kind of began. So I, I was interested as so I was looking at this, because um, the olive, olive trees are kind of the center of the Palestinian world in many ways. And I also happen to love Palestinian olive oil that I get regularly mm. from my friends. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so good, isn't it? It's, it's really good. It's just a like, nice, kicky, organic, earthy flavor to it. I it's the it. best I've ever had. But having said that, I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, what how long this has been going on, and what is the political effect? I mean, look, what we're fa- we're fa- right now, we're facing something that is as bad, if not worse, than what happened in 1967 and what happened in 1948. They're akin. They're, in terms of the expulsion of Palestinians and the war in 67, and then the colonization that began to take place, take place in Gaza and in the West Bank. So, And you're out trying to help farmers create this economy to build olive oil in the midst of that. So talk a bit about that, that struggle to do that, what you face, and the kind of tensions that must, be, that must arise in even trying to do that. Yeah, there are immense, diverse, and deep challenges that come uh, of being a farmer in the West Bank. Those challenges are uh, manyfold, and I'll just run, give you a, a few examples Please, of yeah, what yeah. that looks like. Um, they pay exorbitant prices for water up to 30 times what an Israeli settler who is farming will pay for water, 30 times. They're not allowed to use electricity or to ha- or to build a sh- a shelters for shade on their land. Their access, you may know that their access to the land is often restricted. Um, settler violence is a really big thing. On a good year before this war began, settlers would routinely uproot or destroy 2,000 olive trees every year. Since the war began, settler violence is up 400%. All of these challenges add up to a situation which is quite purposeful in in that policy-wise, the occupation has made it very difficult for farmers to do what they do. There are some reasons behind that. We can get uh, into those reasons in a bit, if you like. But so what we've done with uh, uh, treat them along with the Palestinian Farmers Union and the Palestinian Farmers Union actually designed the the prototype for a freedom farm. They came up with a prototype that is specifically designed to address the challenges of what it means to farm under the occupation. And that prototype is basically we will plant 250 olive trees on a two and a half acre tract of land. They will be irrigated during the dry summer months, at least, we'll lay down an irrigation system for them. And importantly, every single freedom farm that we plant is is surrounded by steel fencing for the protection of both the farmers and the trees. So is it a very difficult situation uh, to plant nowadays? Yes, it is. But our partner on the ground, the Palestinian Farmers Union, is exceedingly good at what they do. And the structure that we are working with, this idea of a freedom farm, is a workable one right now. It is scalable. Right now, uh, there are a little more than 70 freedom farms that have been planted across the West Bank. Every single one of those freedom farms is still standing. It seems uh, that when you mentioned the Palestinian Farmers Union, as, as I've seen was written, have 20,000 small-scale small, small scale farmers who are farming around the West Bank for the most part. But the, given the politics of this moment, A, restricting, restricting water, the ability of water, the ability to, to really irrigate the way that things have to be irrigated on a farm. This war itself, one of my dearest friends, Ali Zareb, who is from Ramallah, his nephew, walking down the street during the midst of this war, shot in the back by settlers. Ooh. And so... Yeah. How does this function yeah. in the midst of all this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry to hear about that. Uh, there is an, uh, another story which I pers- which kind of like really hit me hard, uh, which was another farmer. His name was Bilal Saleh. You may have heard about him. Uh, if you do, he would have been on your radar last October. An olive tree farmer who was shot and killed in cold blood by Israeli settlers as he was harvesting the olives uh, on his farm. That story got a fair amount of play um, in the media for all the obvious reasons, but it really took the wind out of my sail, uh, Mark, and it landed uh, very personally with me. 
And Abbas, the president of the uh, PFU, the Palestinian Farmers Union, and I spoke a little bit about what we would like to do in response to, to that, uh, to help ensure that this kind of stuff doesn't happen uh, over and over and over again. And so we ended up planting a freedom farm for his widow, Ikhlas, who was now left without a um, left without somebody who provided for their family and left without a father for her children. So she was now thr- thrust into uh, the dual role of doing that. So we actually, just two months ago, planted uh, a freedom farm for her, ensuring that she would be able to carry on the good work that her husband did. Bilal was, I mean, he loved olive trees. He loved what he did. He loved what he did. Uh, so in, in, in way, but again, we have we provided her with a safe environment in which to still be able to do the thing that her husband uh, did by fencing in that structure. How does this happen? Uh, how do we continue to do this in spite of what's going on? That is really testament to um, the resilience and the strategic creativity that the Farmers Union brings to bear in their day-to-day activities. They know where it's safe to plant. They know how far they can push the envelope. They know the intersection of uh, what it means to plant for people who are in great need, where food insecurity is also high, but to do so in a region which is sufficiently distanced from whatever settlements might be, uh, as to make sure that this is not just a statement that we're making, but a really sustainable farm that we're beginning here. I don't know. Does that answer your question? I feel like I went it, off on a little tangent. It does, but it, it leads to a couple of other questions for me. One is, one is about you and one's about the Palestinian farmers at this moment. So how many times have you been back and forth to, to Palestine? One. One. Uh, just one. Uh, that I was there <clears throat> several years ago, mm-hmm. and it was when I encountered, I, I, as I mentioned, I went there to kind of like start... I, to explore uh, this ideology for a book that I'm working on right now. Um, My life kind of went uh, off in an entirely different direction. But that one time that I was there was enough to plant the seed of freedom for Palestine. No pun um, intended. (laughs) None at all. (laughs) But thank you for noticing it. Um, I I mean, as writers, I kind of like love this. I love wordplay. And so the idea of freedom... I don't know. I just li- I li- I like I like the um, the name of our organization so much. Um, so I've been there once. Uh, I've obviously been in continual contact with our partners on the ground there. He and I speak several times a week, uh, at least. So while my heart and head is here in Philadelphia, um, my soul is also bifurcated. Uh, and is is in the very difficult territory of what it means to do what they're doing in the West Bank right now. One other thing, I, I wanted to mention this. You know, you talked about Philadelphia, and I, I was walking around Jerusalem one day, and I came across a carbon copy of the Liberty Bell in a park in Jerusalem, and it was just the oddest thing, Mark, because as a Philadelphian, I know what the Liberty Bell looks like. It's this very iconic right, thing. Right, right. And they had taken... And literally done a carbon copy of the spell. And so at the time, the war hadn't broken out. And the issues that you and I are talking about were, they were still front and center uh, for all the obvious reasons. But this idea of what real personal liberty means, whether that's economic, geopolitical, cultural, uh, land-based, it just got amped up for me uh, in an additional degree. And to know that there is this other thing another copy of the Liberty Bell in uh, very near many of the farms that we are planting uh, just make it even more, I don't know, what's the word? Symbolic, I guess. I'm curious, in your conversations with Abbas and others, since this war began in Gaza, how has that changed and altered the dynamic? It was already difficult because Israel has put restrictions on what Palestinian farmers can do, how much water they can get, has made it very difficult for people to survive on the West Bank doing the work they've done for generations and generations and generations. So I'm curious how all the work you all are doing, how's, how has it been affected by this war? We do what we do strategically and with great consideration to what the risks are. And when I say that the PFU is exceedingly good 
at assessing those risks and operating in spite of uh, in spite of them. It's not uh, an exaggeration. They're really good at what they do, and uh, so the work of planting goes on. War or no war, we are still planting for the future. I, I mean, just you know, as I w- watched the documentary, which we'll, we'll be covering, where olive trees. Weep. So, and, and Mark, yeah, Mark, just uh, 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 one a little thing. We have planted over the past two and a half months ten freedom farms. Each one of those farms is 250 trees that have to be sourced, planted, planned. So many things need to come together to do this. Uh, the irrigation system needs to be uh, brought there. There are roadblocks that the IDF puts up uh, daily. And so there are so many factors in play that go into planting a farm, but we still do it. I mean, this is what they do. And they're used to operating under challenges and obstacles because this is kind of like the Palestinian experience. It's been the experience for decades now. It's just been amped up considerably. So so, so the question is, given the occupation, given this war, given all the obstacles to any farmer who's Palestinian at the moment to survive, A, how do they survive in this program? And B, how do you get the olive oil out? So you, yeah, these are thoughtful questions. Um, olive oil, uh, olive trees It takes a while for them to fruit. The trees that we plant are between two and three years old. It's going to take them two to three more years for their first harvest. So what we'll do to make sure that the farmer has a sustainable income is use the irrigation systems that we lay down by planting uh, vegetables or herbs um, in the middle of the tracks of trees that we plant. So, for example, if we plant za'atar or thyme, for a farmer, that is uh, an herb that can be harvested four times a year. So that farmer can take zatar to the market and sell it and make sure that they have an income until the point where their olive trees start to fruit. That's what it means to do this in the short term. In the long term, when the trees start to fruit and the farm becomes a mature farm, a mature farm will generate, I think it's uh, thirty six or thirty four or thirty six thousand dollars of olive oil every year. That's a lifeline for a farmer and for and for their community. Um, and if you actually multiply that out over the five hundred year lifespan of an olive tree, because I don't know if you knew this, I didn't realize this until I realized it, but an olive tree is natural lifespan is 500 years or more. Mm -hmm. If you multiply that out over their 500 year lifespan, from that single two and a half acre tract of land, you are generating $18 million of olive oil that will feed 15 generations of farmers and their families, bring that many communities together, and also has a really cool environmental impact because, uh, Olive trees are also really good for the environment. So it also becomes a form of climate action. Uh, The trees on a freedom farm will collectively synthesize, I think it's 9 million pounds of carbon also over their natural lifespan. So the short-term benefits and the short-term challenges, because one day this war will be over, but those trees will still be in the ground and doing the work of what it means to be an olive tree for the farmer who chooses to to farm them. And the benefits of that will carry long past the immediate challenges of what it means to to be a farmer this day in in this climate and environment. And I think another point here to talk a bit about is important is that, which which has been happening a lot in parts of the developing world, but it's really important here in Palestine at the moment, is that a lot of these farmers and the people involved who are actually doing this are women. Yeah. So that's the other thing uh, that uh, we do is we do the work of supporting, along with the PFU, gender equality in the West Bank. And 50% of the freedom farms that treat them for Palestine plants are planted for female farmers. Uh, And in doing so, we're strengthening their roles, not just in their families, but also in their communities and eventually in local local government as well. So the act of planting, just planting a tree the intention that you bring to it has so much delightful carryover into so many different arenas, uh, and gender equality is just one of those arenas. 
one of the things that strikes me as I was reading about this and watching the film is that both Israelis and Palestinians love their olive oil. And the olive tree, the olive branch has been a tree and branch of peace. Mm, yeah. And a uniting force. And symbolically even, it, it's kind of important, I mean, to see when you talk about the future, that these, if, if something like this, these trees and the movement around these trees and, and working with Palestinian farmers can help generate the peace yeah. across these lines. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it turning a, 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 a kind of a symbolic victory into kind of a material victory. Yeah. Isn't it lovely? I mean, I, one loves the olive tree for so many different reasons, but amongst those reasons uh, at the forefront for me is what they represent in the form of an olive branch and what it means to extend an olive branch across the world to the West Bank in the act of planting. The way I think about it, Mark, is that by doing what we're doing, we're actually putting the building blocks for a longer term peaceful coexistence into the earth uh, itself. And the way I think about it is that we're taking a polarized holy land and turning it into a thriving and prosperous heartland. And if we can't learn to kind of like be in this together, do this together, coexist together. Looking to the olive tree, which has been on this contentious land that's been fought over for thousands of years, it doesn't know geographical boundary. It doesn't know religious identity or cultural identity. The olive tree, they all kind of, and as trees, they communicate with each other invisib in, invisibly under the ground, in so many ways, these trees are examples of who we might yet be and become. That, that, that's a, a beautiful thought, you know, and I think we'll be talking very shortly uh, with Abbas Milhem, who is Executive Director of the Palestinian Farmers Union. Thank you, Sarah, for making the introductions and hearing more about that, because I'm also very curious about the, what these farmers are facing now in the midst of this war. 50,000 Palestinians killed, mostly women and children, and what the obstacles that people who are even working with you are facing in harvesting, selling their food, staying alive to do the work. I mean, imagine doing all this in the midst of this war. Yeah, that's astonishing. Um, he will be an exquisite spokesperson to talk a little bit more about that in greater depth and dimension than I could ever muster. Well, I'm really glad we, we made this connection. And, and uh, um, Cyrus Copeland, I really do appreciate the work you're doing. It's, it's, it's really critically important. And people might say, he's only planting olive trees. What do you mean only planting olive trees? He's building a world, helping to build a world, a sustainable world for farmers and for peace in the future. It's a really critical kind of point. And before I conclude here, I want you, if you could, uh, and we'll put this on the screen, I mean, on the screen, we're on audio, but we'll, we'll put this down on, on, online, how people can be in touch with you and how they can help. They can connect with us on our website, uh, treatemforpalestine.org read a little bit more about what they do, and if they decide that they would like to join this trevolution, quote-unquote, and be a force of planting instead of fighting for change, uh, we would welcome uh, that assistance and their donations with great gratitude. And I'm sure you're saying treat them, T-R-E-E-D-O-M. Treat them for Palestine. Yes. Right. <laughs> right, right. So they don't look up F, it's T. But this has been one of Cyrus Cobb. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to our conversation with Abbas Malhem and the people who are in the movie itself, Where Olive Trees Weep. And uh, this has been an important conversation, and let's we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much for your introductions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a delight. Thank you, Mark. Once again, let me thank Cyrus Copeland for joining us today. You can be in touch with his organization, Treedom, that's T R E E D O M. For Palestine at treatemforpalestine.org. And thanks to Cameron Grandino for running the program today. Audio editor Halina Nuck for doing all the work she does to make us sound good. Rosette Sawali for producing the Mark Steiner Show. And the Tyler's Kayla Rivara for making it all work behind the scenes. And everyone here at The Real News for making this show possible. Please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll get right back to you. Once again, thank you to Cyrus Copeland for joining us today and the work that he does. And keep listening as we explore the lives of people resisting the occupation, Palestinians and Israelis, who are featured in the film documentary Where Olive Trees Weep. And we'll be talking with Abbas Milhelm, Executive Director of the Palestinian Farmers Union, 
in the coming week. Gentlemen, we talked about on this program today. So for the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.